Um, I don't know how could I get those to you. I think you'll probably figure out what happened if you just read the comments. I forgot to finish the proof. On the yeah, I knew you. I know you knew that, but yeah, he knew Minkowski's inequality, so I noticed that later on. But I was. I give you all the extra credit points, so I think, uh, yeah, it was a decent compromise. Um, so there were, I think, a total of three extra credit points on the first part to go through the proof of completeness. Um, nobody actually went through and proved the extra credit part um, on showing that there is only a unique solution. Um, in the C01 problem, <coughs> to the uh, minimizing vector, um, that you couldn't use the uh, inner products space theory on. You had to just show it directly because the, you were in a non inner product space. So people tried to go that way and it didn't work. Some people did anyway. Other people just said, ah, I give up. It was just, a, it's not a very difficult argument to show that if you subtract one, that's the unique solution. Uh, but uh, let's see, and then the last part, I guess there was proved that the norm of S is equal to the norm of H. That was pretty straightforward, but I gave a point for it anyway. So there was a po there were some points on the test, but um, and some people just, you know, had trouble with that problem number three, the double projection problem, and some people had, uh, I think there were some computational errors. People got into something and they started making computations that were just wrong. That was, I think, just uh, inexperience with the subject. Uh, saying, well, I think I can compute my way out of this, and yes, you could, but the computations were wrong. Okay. Uh, so the instinct was right, the uh, carry through was wrong in some cases. So, um, uh, yeah. So, all in all, I was pretty happy. People seem to have mastered the first two chapters of the text pretty well. So, that'll come in handy. In the future, I think. <laughs> All right, and I think we're only going to have one more test. The this final. way, yeah, we'll have a final exam, and I guess. Uh, you have a cold? Yeah, I got the cold. I thought it was hay fever, and it turned out to be a cold. <laughs> so now I have the cold. You sound a little bit different. Yeah, I'm a little bit now. I'm a little bit throaty because it's pretty much it. It's past the first stage. I had the. <clears throat> but it wasn't a very bad one. Yeah, no, I, I was thinking we like could get that. Well, I would be happy if it was gone in three days. At my age, I don't know if that's going to happen. But anyway, it was not a real killer. It was a little baby cold. So I'm hoping it stays that way. <laughs> okay. Can I ask a sure. Before we start? Sure. Let's get some questions. Orderings. Partial orderings. So if you have a is less than or equal to c, and you have b is less than or equal to c. Is it possible for A and B to be incomparable, or do they have to be related in some No, way? they don't have to be comparable at all. You simply could have in some... Is it possible for them to be incomparable? Oh, yes, definitely. Okay. Definitely. I mean, most likely incomparable. Most likely. Yeah, I mean, you have 1, 2 is a subset of 1, 2, 3. Right. You have 1, 3 is a subset of 1, 2, 3. Mm -hmm. Okay? And these are incomparable. So that's typical okay. that they'd be incomparable. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So um, any other questions about the uh, anything to this point? Chapter four, harmonic theorem, homework problems. I think I didn't put it on the website yet. But that did make uh, uh, 4.3 number 9 and made that extra credit for your homework, which is going to be due, what, 
the day after we get back from spring break. Uh, make that an extra credit problem. Also, I pointed out that a 4.3 number, um, is it 14, I think, that is supposed to be a real inner product space? So what is not a real inner product space? Yeah, a real inner product space. In order to make sense of the problem. 4.3 number 14 it's supposed to be a real, I think it's, it's a real inner product space. It seems to be a, an omission from the um, real norm, I'm sorry, real norm space. Sorry. Because what we're taking there is we wanted to have a hyperplane. Hyperplane was of the form set of all x such that f of x is equal to c or r, I think I put, and the half space. So I wanted to be able to take, well, equal was okay, but r is a, a real number. Okay, and then I had half space is the set of all x such that f of x is less than or equal to r. Okay, of course there are two half spaces, and then you're supposed to make sense of that problem. <coughs> so the real norm space, <coughs> problem number 14. All right, I put those things on the website too, and just in case you forget about them. Okay. So what I want to do now is we just want to move on and get uh, some kind of application of the Hahn-Bonnick theorem, see what we can do with it. So the first, you might wonder what the, uh, application of the Hahn-Bonnick theorem. How can we do something with that? That's what I'd like to do today. Um, I don't have the notes prepared, so I'm going to have to maybe look at the book a little bit. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's been a pretty busy week. So, um, first, what, okay, so what we want to do is, is we want to consider um, the space X equals C01 with the, max, with the uniform metric or max norm slash soup norm, soup or max norm, okay? So what do we have then? We have x of t is continuous and the norm is the maximum, zero less or equal to t less or equal to one, the absolute value of x of t. Okay, so, and that's a complete space, so we have a Bonnach space. All right, this is complete. The question is, what are the uh, linear functionals on that space? Bounded linear functionals. What do the bounded linear functionals look like? On X. We can guess a few of them. You could say, uh, I mean, we can give examples, but what would they all look like? In somehow, in some sense, okay? So give me an example of a, of a linear function on this space. You'd expect, I think what you think of is you think of uh, each, you sort of think of these as infinite dimensional vectors where the T is the index. So linear combinations of evaluations, for example. So this would be an example of a bonilinear, a bonilinear function. So would something like f of uh, x equals summation i goes from 1 to uh, some finite number, capital N, let's say, um, f, excuse me, not f, x, x, and then some uh, x of t i. That would be a linear, bounded linear functional.
with it. Okay? And let's see, what if I uh, integrate it against some other integral function? Would that be a bonded linear functional? Why would this be a bonded linear functional? Well, uh, you could take, simply you know that the, that the absolute value of f of x is clearly simply less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values x of ti. <clears throat> i goes from 1 to n. Each of these is less than or equal to the norm of, of x. So this is less than or equal to capital N times the norm of x. So you see if n goes to infinity, well, this might not work out so well. But, um, so then I have the norm is less than or equal to n. Okay. Now, could I get the norm equal to n? That's another question. <laughs> okay. Um, Well, certainly, I guess you could uh, get the norm equal to n here. How did you do that? What did you use on your exam to get the the uh, norm equal to 1 on one of those problems? You used the constant function, right? I think I get the constant function here. So if I take x equals to 1, that gives that the um, f of x is simply capital N, all right? And um, the norm of x, while the norm of x is equal to 1, so um, f of x over the norm of x is, great, is equal to n over 1, is greater than or equal to n. So I have that the, therefore the norm of f is on the one hand less than or equal to n, on the other hand, this will give me that the norm of f is greater than or equal to n. So a number can be greater than or equal to itself. <laughs> okay, that's allowed. The reflexivity. Okay, so this tells me that the norm of f, which is certainly greater than or equal, because it's the soup of this expression, all right, is greater than or equal to n. So I have norm of f is equal to n in this case. That's an easy example. But what are all the linear functionals? You might guess a little bit more. Well, now, instead of doing the summation, suppose I do an integral. That should work, right? Suppose I take um, suppose I take uh, f of x equal to, or f of x equal to integral 0 to 1 of x of t. Now there I took, there I took just, there was no absolute value signs or anything like that. And this had to be linear. This is linear, obviously. If I take a, uh, x plus y, I'll just get the x plus y at ti and so on. Um, what if I take some uh, function y of t, some other continuous function? It doesn't have to be continuous even. It just has to be integrable, probably, Riemann integrable. Uh, so it might be a step function, for example. A step function, which means it's a finite linear combination of things like this. So it looks like y of t might look like One. So here's y of t. So it doesn't matter what it takes. At these, at these changeover points, point of discontinuity, it doesn't really matter what, it take, what value it takes. Take a value up there, down here. Okay. Those aren't going to affect the integral. Okay. So here's the values of the function. Okay. <clears throat> This is, okay, and this is still continuous because I'm in C01. Okay. So what kind of, well, is that a bounded, as long as and y is also, um, bounded. Now what's, is this one, what's the norm of this one? What do you think about that? So now what I've done equivalently is basically if I put coefficients in front of the x, all right? then you have to figure out what the norm is. 
So that's not so obvious what the norm of that one would be. So you'd have to start with something like a difference, right? And figure out what that would be, the norm of that one. We can certainly, uh, as long as y is bounded, I can still uh, bring that factor in, but that's not going to give you the right answer for the norm. Okay. In other words, if I put coefficients in front here, like ai, I can certainly take the maximum of the a's time, okay, times n, all right, and that will be a bound for the norm. But is that really equal to the norm? <laughs> okay. So how do you actually, you know, if you want to do this by hand, if you would just take a really simple case, like the case capital N equals 1, I mean 2, and uh, n is 2, 1 is too easy, but if you take n equals 2, take a difference, let's say x t, x 1 half minus x 1 or something like that. So if I just take a really simple case, that would be a step function, well, similar to that. Um, okay. So, um, now this is not going to generate those quite. Why? Because I won't get, uh, how do I just get the evaluation at a single point? I need a delta mass, right? I, if I want to get x of t1, so let's just not worry quite about the norm, but how would I get, this is going to be bounded, how would I get that from this? I can't. I'm just trying to uh, show you what, <laughs> what you're going to have to consider in order to find all linear functionals. All right, how could I get this linear functional from this type of integral? Can I do it? You know anything about delta functions or anything like that? You probably don't uh, know a little bit about it, just the idea of it. But that means I'd have to take y of t um, going to infinity. Okay, so that would be a y of t that would look like this. And this would be a delta function of one half, delta sub one half. I would take a y of t that goes to infinity, a spike like this. Okay. Well, that goes to infinity, and the area under the curve is one. Okay. So that's not really a function, right? But how can you deal with that? What you can deal with is, is something called a measure. <coughs> so. That's, I mean, I have to integrate against such a thing in order to get x of one half. Integral of x of t delta sub one half of t dt, zero to one. That's x of one half. Okay. So that's how I would get that linear function. I'd have to integrate against the delta mass. All right. So this is a little bit. This is a little bit smoother. Okay. <coughs> So I have, somehow I have to bring in the delta mass. How do I do that? Well, um, instead of integrating against the function, you have to integrate against the measure. So you have to talk about measures, roughly speaking. So how do you deal with measures? You can get measures by... Um, Uh, some other device, okay? So that's what I'll bring in. I'll bring in the functions of bounded variation, okay? So let's talk. So this is just kind of the introduction. You're going to need. I want to somehow include this case, right? Because I want to get. I want to be able to represent. I'm going to want to be able to represent these bounded linear functions as some kind of integral that will cover both these cases. All right. Well, let's well, I hope we have to prove that you can. <laughs> okay, so that was one of the starting points. How do I find the? And then classically, um, before even the Lebesgue integral was studied, this was this problem was being studied. What would be the bounded linear functionals on C zero one? Okay. So Reese came before Lebesgue, I believe. That's what he's telling you in this section, four point four. Okay. So
So we get to something called the Riemann Stieltjes integral. So what he's going to do is he's just going to state the theory of the Riemann Stieltjes integral. And so that's what we're going to do. We're just going to state it. But we have to bring in what a function of bounded variation is. So <clears throat> a function of bounded variation. Is w, I'm just going to work on the unit interval. I don't feel like working with AB. <laughs> okay. W on um, 0, 1 is a function. W of T on 0, 1 is a function on 0, 1 um, instead of AB. Work with 0, 1 instead of AB. The author, and of course, it's not really much harder to work with AB. And there are some advantages to that, so you wouldn't get confused with the zero and the one in some other formula, but I don't think that's going to happen much. Okay. So, read the AB case in the book. <laughs> um, WTN01, that's just some bound, a bounded function, a bounded function. So it could be kind of bad. You know, it's just up and down like one when it's rational, zero when it's irrational. That's a bounded function. However, that's not going to be a function of bounded variation. What's a function of bounded variation? Such that the variation of W, what, you, what do you do? Um, you take the soup over all partitions, P, which are finite partitions, P equals uh, zero, uh, T, zero uh, T1 up to, this is T0 equal to zero, let's put it this way, T0 equal to zero, T1 up to T sub N equals one. That's a partition of the interval zero, one, standard business. You take W of T, um, I just want to make sure, let's see, I get to use the same indices as he does. WTJ minus W of TJ minus 1, absolute value. So if it was a monotone function, that's trivial because the disvariation is finite. The monotone function, uh, let's say it's monotone increasing on 0 to 1. Uh, w monotone is obviously a bounded variation. Okay? W monotone, then variation of W over the interval 0, 1, I should put in. Okay? Variation of W, the interval is implicit here. Okay? That would simply be W of 1 minus W of 0 absolute value. Okay, it's a non-negative quantity. Because you just get a telescoping sum here. It'll all be negative, and you have a negative sign in front, it'll all be positive. So you take away the absolute value signs. In other words, in the monotone case. Okay. Um, okay. So, so this is finite. Okay, that's called the variation. Okay? Now, that doesn't actually give a norm. This is, okay, obviously, uh, you can talk the, the linear combination of, of bounded functions. That's, again, a bounded function. And you could easily show up with a little plane around if it took, linear, if it took a sum W and V and put it inside here that at most you would get the variation of W plus the variation of V. So triangle inequality is going to be trivial for this type of, if you wanted to make this the norm, but what's the problem if I take one function and another function which is just a constant apart, all right? If I just take W and W plus one, all right? Then they, um, what's the variation norm of that? That's the variation of one. If I take W minus W plus one, I take the variation of that, okay? That's a, two different functions, right? That's the variation of one, or negative one, doesn't matter, that's zero. 
a cost that has zero variation. So that would not make a good distance, right? The variation of the difference would not make a good distance. So I don't have a norm. But you can make a norm by putting, uh, you can make a norm space. On of the functions with bounded variation. It's called bounded variation if the variation is finite. Okay? Okay. By taking the norm, by taking um, the norm of W equal to, let's say, just the value at the origin. So that'll distinguish between the constants plus the variation of W. You could take the norm, you could take the value at, at the point one, too. You would, so the point in the interval zero, they put it A here in the book, is not necessarily important. Uh, you could, there's different norms you could put. But this would be one natural one. Uh, and so we talk about the functions of bounded variation, BV01, BV for bounded variation. So that's going to be, um, now is that, um, That's a space. Okay. That's a space. Can you think of a continuous function that's not a bounded variation? Are continuous functions necessarily a bounded variation? What do you think? <laughs> yeah, are continuous functions necessarily a bounded variation? No. Because um, I just have to have a lot of up and down, right? Whenever I go up and down, I get a uh, big contribution. Okay, so the, the whole the whole point is that if I go zigzag, that I get um, a lot. All right. So you want to, you want to, if I go like this, okay, and this is, uh, let's just make this uh, height C and minus C here, okay, just to make an example. So this is, I just drew a picture, and it's just obviously linear here, linear here, and linear here. What is the variation of this function, W? And uh, don't worry about the this part, okay, the W is zero. What's the variation of this thing? So I'm gonna put down, lay down a partition, right? And I'm gonna, um, I'm basically gonna get the height here, right, C, then I'm gonna get all the difference of heights here, okay, with that's the value, so I'm gonna get two C here, and then I'm gonna get a C again, so this is four C. So the number, of, it's the number of ups and downs that's really going to make the, the function big. So all I have to do is make a bunch of ups and downs. So how can I make a bunch of ups and downs? So is it, is it more or less the vertical distance traveled? I don't know, like driving a car? Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you're bouncing, uh, if you're going forward and reverse, you may, okay. So basically you want to, it, it's the, it's, yeah. So if you want, okay, if you want to think about this as the, uh, Well, I'm not going to be able to work it out in terms of velocity, am I? It's the heights, difference of the heights. So what is so what is the difference of the heights? Uh, that's a uh, if this is the position function, right? If this is the position function. W t equals position. Then, and not the velocity curve, but it's the position function. Okay then the total variation would be the uh, total distance traveled, right? 
total distance traveled. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I went to Denver, then I came back to Colorado Springs, then I went to Pueblo, then I went back to Colorado Springs. Okay, the position was plus or zero or minus. Okay, so this is the position function. So it takes into account all the turnarounds. So normally when we talk in calculus, we talk about areas under the curve, and you talk about integrals, and then, but you plot the velocity curve, all right, and talk about uh, and so on. Here, of course, there may not be a velocity. Here, when I made an abrupt turnaround, okay, I didn't come to an immediate stop. I was going, and then all of a sudden, I jerked it into reverse while I was still going forward five miles an hour. Okay? Okay. <laughs> that would, okay, well, what happened to my car? I don't know, went into hyperspace. Okay, somehow I was able to do that. <laughs> okay, so, um, so that's going to be allowed here. All right? You can make it smooth if you want. Okay, it won't change the variation. All right. So this is going to, so the variation is the distance travel, total distance travel. So you can see if I take the constant function, then I'm not going anywhere. There's no distance. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So that's a good way to do it. Now, how do I make the total distance traveled infinite, but not go very far? Well, I just go back and forth between two points many, many times. You know, faster and faster and faster. Brrr. Okay, so that's how I can make it. And so I can make a continuous function, let's say, um, something that looks like this. <coughs> I said I need to I want to make it continuous at the origin. Well, all I have to do is is something like come in like this, let's say how about um, x, x sine um, pi over x or something like that. Okay. That's a continuous function. As x goes to zero since the sine is bounded. Okay, so this is a, um, this is like this. Now, what are, where are the roots? The roots are at x equals to, um, 1 over uh, k, right? Those are the roots. So roughly what's happening is you get to the roots and what's the variation between roots? Variation between roots is, well, you're gonna, is roughly between um, x is about 1 over k and you're getting two of those, okay? Between roots, you're going down and then back up here, okay? So this, the variation within constants is between, is roughly summation 2 over k, k goes from 1 to infinity, okay, which is infinite, okay, this is like w of x, so there's a continuous function whose variation is infinite, okay, so it's easily bounded below Okay, I could go, it's certainly greater than or equal to 2 over k plus 1. Okay. That kind of a thing. All right. So they don't have to be continuous. I mean, continuous ones don't have to be a bounded variation. So continuous functions are not a subset of this one. This looks like more because it's bounded, right? <laughs> but it's not. It's not, a, it's not a partial order inclusion. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. They're not related, you're not included, one is not included in the other. Okay? The bond, functions of bounded variation clearly do not have to be continuous, they can be discontinuous, so step functions were easily a bounded variation. It's just the number of jumps, basically. All right. And, um, okay. So where can we go with that? Now we get to Reese's formula. The claim is that I can do a Riemann Steel. Well, first I need the Riemann Steel's integral. So now I want to talk about the Riemann Steel's integral. I claim that what you're going to do now is take one of these functions, w, w of t equals t, of course, is the classic one. 
and that's how you construct the Riemann integral. Wt equal to t gives Riemann integral in the gives the Riemann integral. What you do is you construct given x in c zero one. Construct uh, Riemann integral of a continuous function. So we're only going to consider con integrals, Riemann Steelitz integrals, where the one function is continuous. Okay. So given x and c zero one, construct um, the the sum, the Riemann sum, which he calls s s of p equals summation x of um, tj um, w of tj minus w of tj minus 1. So this is a particular one where I actually take the right-hand endpoint of the interval. So this is not all Riemann sums if w of t equals t, but I'm taking the right-hand endpoint of the interval and taking the uh, displacement here. From the past, okay, j goes from one to n. So I construct this thing. It looks like a Riemann sum if w of t equals to t. All right. Do we talk about the? He he calls eta of p equal the instead of calling it the norm of p because he doesn't want to use the norm. This is the gap of p formerly called the norm of P if you teach calculus one out of certain books, okay, which is the maximum of Tj minus Tj minus one. We all know the theory of the Riemann integral, at least if we've been teaching it all for a while, okay. If we take an analysis course, we've seen that one many times. Okay, so it's the length of the longest subinterval. Okay. We know as long as if we take W of T equals to T, Right, we take the Riemann case, we know that uh, as long as the gap goes to zero, then these sums converge to the integral, the Riemann integral of the continuous function. Or you don't even need a continuous function, you only have to have something called Riemann integral. Okay, then finally the theory comes out, as long as the gap goes to zero uh, and the function is integrable, okay, whatever that means, okay then you get this convergence to the integral. But in particular, in the continuous case, you know that. So I'm not going to go back to the Riemann integration theory. Um, so what we have here, as long as it turns out all you need is that the variation is finite for this function. Okay, so the claim is the riemann skilchus theory Integral is the following theorem is uh, theory is the following claim. The author just makes a claim on page 226. Doesn't advertise it as a claim or anything. Just says there is. Okay. All right. Claim. Claim. Given x and c zero one and w in the functions of bounded variation on zero one, okay, there exists some integral, a number i, real number. Actually, uh, these functions don't have to be real, okay, so everything could be complex, okay. such that for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists an eta, or delta greater than zero, at least better put it delta greater than zero, so that as long as the gap of the partition is small enough, eta of p is less than delta, then these, this riemann steelitz sum I think it's I before E. Yeah, still to sum S of P minus the the integral is less than epsilon. Okay. 
So we get convergence to I. So Riemann still S of P goes to I as the gap goes to zero. Okay. And then we call this I the integral zero to one X of T uh, W D T. There's a number of ways, either W D T or D W of T. And there's two ways, and he writes it this way, D W of T. There's two ways to write it, depending on your interest. Okay? W D T or D W of T. Okay. I think DWT is a lot more standard, but sometimes I write WDT, okay? So now, um, and moreover, if W is itself uh, differentiable and the derivative is Riemann integrable, then you actually just get what we had before, X of T, Y of T, DT. So if, if W is differentiable, okay? With, with Riemann integrable, uh, derivative. Let's see, what does he call it? W prime, or does he call it something else? Then, yeah, he just calls it W prime. Then, you simply have uh, the I is the integral 0 to 1 x of t, W prime of t dt. So as long as there is a velocity, Okay, you can integrate against the velocity function. Okay, so we're leaving out a lot of details here. We're basically saying that this, there is a theory for integration for the Riemann integral that extends. At least when the integrand x is a continuous function, okay, you can extend it. So I'm, only, I'm not extending it to uh, non-continuous ones at this point. Okay. Moreover, what you get is an inequality. What do you get for the um, value of this integral? What's a in basic uh, inequality? Basic inequality is as follows that, moreover, what you get, what would you get? If I take, so here's the, here's the AIJs, right? I mean, here's the, uh, the coefficients of the xtj that I was talking about for my linear functional before. So these are now um, aj, x of tj. So I actually do have some, right, ajs. What would I do if I had the ajs in this form, okay? So the ajs are in a particular form. I've taken them, aj is wtj minus wtj minus 1. So if I wanted aj plus 1, um, Well, I mean, so that means there's some kind of telescoping sum relationship between the AJs, right? So if I have AJ equals W of TJ minus W of TJ minus 1, and I call this thing uh, BJ, well, that's, that's WJ, okay? Then what I have is that the sum uh, W0 plus the sum I goes from 1 to J WI is equal to I'm sorry, of, of AJ, AI is equal to WJ. Okay, yeah. So, or do, some A is like this W0, okay, where W0 is 0. Let's say, uh, doesn't matter what W0 is. W0 is a W at 0. Okay? So that would be, uh, if you think about it that way, then I have these coefficients related to the w's this way. All right. So if I write the coefficients that way, right, particular parameterization of the coefficients of the xtj's when I was considering a linear functional earlier, well, then what do you get? You obtain that integral 0 to 1 x of t w oh, dw of t What's the absolute value of that? That's less than or equal to, that's my f of x, okay? 
that should be less than or equal to, um, let's see, I can take the, um, you can just think about it in terms of the, well, it's equal to the limit of these sums, of some sum, um, x of tj of some, for some partition, w tj minus w tj minus 1. Okay, I'm sorry, no absolute value signs there. My absolute value signs outside. And then take the absolute values inside. So this would be, this is limited as the partition A of P goes to 0. So then I would have, I just want to get, I'm not going to try to prove this, I'm just showing the indication. Okay? This would then be less than or equal to, well, the less than or equal to the absolute value here. This is a parenthesis. Okay, then I bring the absolute values inside, less than or equal to um, soup anyway, over all partitions, um, some x of tj, absolute value, wtj minus wtj minus 1, and that would therefore give you equal to... Um, less than or equal to, um, now I put the max norm in here, right? So that's the norm of x, continuous function, the max norm. And then I have what I have left is variation norm of w. Okay, now if we specialize this to the rebound interval where w t is just w, is w of t is just t, the case w t equals to t, then this just gives a, the basic fact that you used on your test that integral 0 to 1 x of t dt, okay, absolute value is less than or equal to the norm of x times 1 minus 0, the length of the interval, okay? <laughs> right, you use that. Okay. On your test, because you just the maximum inside and I have a constant integrand, and I'm integrating the constant from 0 to 1. So I get 1 minus 0 for the length of the interval. So it's consistent with that. So this is the generalization of that business. Okay, so that looks like, therefore, that I can take any uh, linear function, I can take my linear function at least up to this level, Riemann's t equals integral, okay? But you know that, because now I have the norm inequality. Okay? So as long as W is a finite variation, boundary variation, then I get a finite number here. So, and it turns out that also by taking um, this W of T simply to be um, a step function, okay, that you get back the finite sums, okay. So well, how, would I, how do I recover um, a particular function like how would I get x of one half? How would I get how would I get um, how would I get integral zero to one x of t w of t, uh, dw of t equal to x of one half? How can I for, for which w for what can I can I get this? Just the evaluation of the continuous function at one half. Can I get that? Well, I think I can because let's see. Let's just take w of t to be at one half. Make it jump by how much? Well, maybe I should make this a constant. Uh, um, make some scaling constant here. A. All right. That would also be a linear function, right? I make the function jump by uh, a. So I'll make it a here. Okay, and then one here. Now, is it going to matter how I do it? Well, let's, let's just make it right continuous then. Okay, just for the heck of it. Okay? Now, is that going to give me... So this jump is A. This is my W of T. What do I get if I actually take the riemann stilches sums for that? 
the Riemann Stilich's sum would be S of P. The only thing that's going to matter in the partition is the number before one half and the number after one half. Okay? So I'm going to get, because all the other terms in the sum are going to be zero, because W of Tj minus W of Tj minus 1 is going to be zero. Right? W of Tj minus W of Tj minus 1 is equal to zero unless Tj minus 1 is less than a half is less than or equal to Tj. Okay, so I need the T. If both of them are less than a half, then out. Okay, if one of them is equal to a half, that's okay, as long as it's the right hand endpoint. Okay. So that's going to mean that, my, that, that if I take this as my W of T and I let the X be the, the variable, so W is now fixed and X is the variable. Okay but I'm going to fix X as well for the computation, then what am I going to get? I'm going to get uh, simply X of Tj, okay, times A, okay, <laughs> where Tj is the closest Tj to one-half, okay? Now if I take my partition going to zero, that means Tj, okay, and then now eta of P goes to zero, implies that Tj is going to go to one-half, okay? I call it, well, it's a particular Tj, all right? Tj star or whatever, Tj whatever, all right? So therefore, what this is going to go to, therefore, is this by continuity of x, this is going to go to x of one-half times a. Is that right? Now you say, okay, you skipped an awful lot of theory here, Mario. You just basically said, well, but all I need, all I skipped was the, the basic construction of the integral. <laughs> That's all I skipped. But it's not that bad. It's very similar to the Riemann integral you've already seen. All right. So take your, you can find this Riemann Stilch's integral in uh, lots of books. So basically, just letting the delta x. You could do it for a project if you want. Change. Yeah. Um, normally, when we did the even integrals, we had the, the delta x r the mean sum of constant. Yeah, delta x. Yeah, like here. Okay, so yeah, if I take x. w of t j equal to t and I take a uniform partition, right? Then my this is my this corresponds to the delta x. We'll just call this delta. This is uh, delta of w of t. So here we're okay. generalizing, letting that interval change each for each piece of it. Well, the interval isn't so important. I can still oh, take no, the interval. It's just the difference in. Yeah. It's the measure of the interval, okay, a signed measure of the interval, okay, instead of the length of the interval being the measure of the interval. Right. I'm taking W of T, I'm taking the measure of the interval be the uh, p change in position of my vehicle, okay, over the interval. So I'm not just assuming that I'm moving ahead with uniform speed or uniform motion, okay, in one direction. I'm letting my vehicle go back and forward, okay, and I'm taking the measure of the interval, the small interval to be the change in position. WTJ, which is the position at time at the end point, the right hand end point minus WTJ minus one, the position at the beginning end point. Are we going to consider places where it might have measure zero and then that interval goes to zero there? So that we can have plenty set like that? Or well, certainly, w, uh, w can be, we mean where W is constant. There's certain places where. What? Okay, you can talk about, uh, yeah, well, okay, so what are you, what are you going to do here? I guess there's an integration by parts formula also. I think this may be asking about that. Um, there's an integration by parts formula. Which I haven't written down. Um, you may be asked. Basically, where does this, how does this butt up with the uh, Riemann integral? I mean, the Lebesgue integral. Is that the question? Okay. I'm trying to make the connection with the uh, Lebesgue integral. Okay. Let's see. Um, it's not quite as general, right, as the Lebesgue integral. No. Because I'm only integrating the continuous function. 
Okay, what I'm doing is I'm, what I'm doing is a general measure here, basically, a finite variation and a continuous function. Okay, but the Lebesgue integral does is take the general function and just one nice measure. Okay. Yes. So the. Uh, Okay, well, I'm not writing down the integration by parts formula. What is the integration by parts formula? I don't know if he writes down the integration by parts formula. Wait a second. No, he doesn't. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to see where it falls between the Riemann one and the Lebesgue. Somewhere the difference is like between each side or something. So that well, the Lebesgue corresponds to WT equals to T. Sure. Okay. But then you can take a general function. So that's generalized in terms of the integrand. Okay. But here we've generalized the, uh, the measure. Okay. So. Of course, what you, you can generalize the Lebesgue integral. I mean, you can have, uh, you don't have to take the Lebesgue measure. You can take these other kinds of things. So, um, um, So you can ha you can extend this to more general functions than continuous functions too. Okay, here in this Riemann integration. I mean, in this Riemann Stoltz integral. So you can extend this one as well. So this extends. And then the measure we just define when we actually do the problem is is this measure is a generalized measure or is it going to be something we're familiar with? Or? This W of T. Yeah. Well, what we want to get is this theorem here. What if the linear functional is on C0 once? That's all I'm going to do here. There aren't actually any problems in this section. Okay. <laughs> Believe it or not. Okay. One section without problems. <laughs> Too bad, huh? I wanted to do this. Okay, so here's Rich's theorem. For all this to get the introduction, I'm not going to be able to prove it today, so we'll sketch it quickly next time, I guess, and maybe we can get started on it, okay? But let's get at least the application of the Hobonic theorem to get started on the proof, okay? So what you're going to do is x is C01, okay? Then every bounded linear functional on um, X is of the form can be represented f of x equals integral 0 to 1 x of t dw of t for some w in the functions of bounded variation on 0, 1. Obviously we already showed that this is a linear functional. Obviously it's linear in x, this integral. Okay, if I take x and y Add them up. Okay. This, the, then I get this. So this is a linear functional with norm at most variation w with and further further the norm of f is equal to the variation of w. Every is of the form and has total variation this. So in other words, given f, it has a norm already, it can be represented in this form for some w with variation of w equal to the norm of f. Okay. Now it's not quite unique because obviously if I take w, change the w by a constant, then I get the same um, linear functional. Okay, that's a triviality. You might ask, is there a unicity beyond that? Okay. 
But that might depend on the linear functional. But let's see. We'll get to that. So how do you actually... How do you actually um, What you're going to need is you're going to need an extension um, of the given linear functional on C01 to linear functional on bounded functions. So that's going to be the application of the Hambonic theorem. Okay. So you're going to want to be able to. Um, extend this linear functional. That's the proof method. Okay. What I want to be able to do is, what I'm going to want to do is I want to um, be able to calculate um, the value, I would basically want to handle step functions, okay? I basically want to be able to handle step functions. In other words, I want to take, uh, basically I have an integration by parts, okay? Formula that I, that's not being displayed here, okay? I should have written that down. I'll have to make that explicit next time. So you said it's not in the book? No, I don't think okay. so. It's easier to write down, though. Okay. But basically, what I want to be able to do is, see, I have only continuous functions here. I want to be able to apply my f to uh, step functions, at least. Okay. So first step is, given f, uh, a bounded linear functional, bounded, uh, bounded linear functional on C01. Uh, this is sitting inside the bounded functions on 0, 01. A much bigger space. Linear space. That's a norm space. I don't have to make it a Bonnach space. It doesn't have to be Bonnach space. This is sitting inside the bounded functions on 0, 01 with the same norm. Where the norm is Again, x of t, well, it's the soup norm, equals the soup x of t. 0 less or equal to t less or equal to 1. Okay? So it's actually a subspace, same norm, because the soup just becomes the max when I go to continuous functions. All right? So it's the same norm, that's the important thing. So now I can say, therefore, by Hunt-Bonnick there, and this is a norm space, My f is a is a, a bounded linear function on here. So by theorem four three two, that had to do with bounded uh, linear functionals on subspaces. Okay. On Bonnach for norm spaces. There exists an extension f tilde. Okay. Uh, from C01 to B01 with um, extension, there exists an extension of F, linear extension. F tilde from C01 with the norm being the same as it was begin with. So that's the nice thing. We're going to be able to preserve the norm. So therefore, I'll be able to take, uh, we will be able to, we can, with, uh, we will be able to compute uh, f tilde of a step function. So what I need to be able to do is I need to talk about what's a step function a little bit more carefully. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take chi um, 
chi of t. I'm simply going to make that equal to 1 for 0 luster equal to um, I'm sorry, chi uh, sub t of s. I'm going to have to write it like that. Chi sub t of s is 1 if 0 less or equal to s less than or equal to t. And it's 0 if uh, t less than s less than or equal to 1. Okay. So that's the characteristic function of the interval 0 to t. Characteristic function, chi for characteristic function of the interval 0 to t. So it's 1 on the interval and 0 off the interval. Okay? This is like a simple function, isn't it? Yeah. Simple function or a step function, same idea. Okay? So you're going to take linear combinations of these. Okay? And that's going to be what a step function is. So if I take, um, so if I just want to make this function, right, let's say it steps up like this, and it comes like this, let's say this is 2 thirds and this is 1, and this is uh, a half, and this is just 1 here, okay, for the height. How would I make that function out of such things here? Well, that's pretty easy, okay, <laughs> but it's just going to be... Um, I guess I'm going to have to take, because this is higher here, that's going to have to be um, one times chi sub one of s. This is the s axis, okay? That's going to give me the constant function one, okay? Over cross minus um, the chi so two third minus one half the chi two thirds of s. So that's kind of a hard way to do it. But it's easier if I if I consider differences of these chi's. Those are going to be um, characteristic functions of intervals that are not based at zero, right? So if I take chi sub uh, two thirds minus chi sub zero, which chi sub zero is simply the zero function basically, okay then that's going to be one-half of this, okay, plus um, one of chi of one minus chi of two-thirds. Let's see if that comes out to be the same, okay? What happened here is the, um, where chi of zero kind of basically gets lost because it's, it's zero. Chi of zero is zero except at the left hand end point, so am I going to have to worry about that? Uh, except for s equal to zero, which I don't worry about, okay? So I'm going to be able to ignore one point, because I'm integrating against continuous functions. <coughs> so that's a little bit easier to write the step function, easier way to write the step function. Basically, I just have to take, in other words, I want to take a linear combination of a characteristic one half times this interval, plus one times that interval. Okay. So it was hard if I try to do it without this, this differencing. So those are the differences. Okay. So I can take my F tilde as such a differences. Okay. And that's exactly where we're going to want to start next time then. So we're going to compute that and show um, that indeed um, you can get this thing going. So what you're going to do is you're going to take W, the, so the formula is, the formula, the claim is, is that, that the formula is, is that W of T is simply going to be F tilde of this chi sub T. Alright, so uh, this is a function, right? Chi sub T is the indicator function. So the, form, the claim is that this is going to be the answer. Okay, and so then the, the work is to do it, and, and also the work is to try to motivate that if you want to spend a little bit more time on that. Okay, 
I mean, you can get it to work. You can follow the proof here. So you might wonder why exactly that's supposed to be. Okay. <laughs> okay. But that's F tilde of the of the function. Okay, that measures the interval zero. T, the interval zero T. Okay. All right, so why don't we take a break, come back with a little bit of renewed energy, finish this up a little bit with the, the riemann stieltjes integral. That's just an application, and then try to get the next couple sections and go on to the next material. See, there's a lot more applications of the Hanbonic there. But this is one of the classical ones. Then the Hanbonic yeah. there, the generality of it. Yeah, well, we to see where it kind of goes with Yeah, I, see, I need to just sort of magically pull this thing out of the hat. You must say, what the heck is that? Okay, so I'm going to get all these inequalities and so on, norm inequalities and stuff, and this is going to come for free, right? I'm not going to have to construct that thing. Yeah. Did you say? Oh, I did have. I give you your test, right? Yeah. Okay. I was going to ask about.